In our previous video, we presented a hypothesis, a theory believed by many, one of a now lost or possibly hidden race of ancient giants. Surprisingly, however, recently, although China is seen as an infamously secretive country, with many tombs and ancient pyramids of gargantuan proportions rarely aerial photographed, let alone explored, it seems that they have, at last, stolen the archaeological world stage with the announcement of a discovery which we may relish, but those whom these remains rest just beyond the clutches of, we would presume rather get a hold of themselves to study and then store away in hidden archives, far from public view, an ongoing effort we have personally read of, dating back to the early 1900s. An ancient graveyard, complete with over 500 giant human remains, has not only been accidentally discovered, but publicly exhumed and most crucial of all, photographed for all the world to see within China. Could this be a retaliatory move with other motives at play? If our previously mentioned theory is true, it would enable man to explain the inexplicably, seemingly impossible size of many of the world's megaliths, and indeed still standing megalithic structures of the world. How a pyramidal, treasury, and many other ancient architectures, lintels, and top stones, often weighing many hundreds of tons, were not only transported from quarries many hundreds of miles, but placed aloft many meters with seeming ease. Furthermore, we have in the past not only postulated and have also presented reams of witness testimony and photographic cooperation, still to be found in newspaper archives across the Western world, describing these finds, but also the Smithsonian's efficiency in not only dealing with the matter, but disappearance of any further reporting, thus expiration. This also supporting the reason for lost pieces of the puzzle, which is inhibiting us from unlocking the secrets to these sites' construction. Perhaps we may never know the true motivations for such a controversial exposure in China. But nonetheless, the resulting fallout of proof presented for our community is a step closer to the truth, the untangling of a tired and tangled web of lies in which many have weaved. For at the bottom of Pandora's box, there is always hope. Many attributed the legend surrounding the great king of Uruk and many of the city's written attributes to mythology. Uruk is said to have become famous as the capital city of the King Gilgamesh, the ancient ruler and hero of the Epic of Gilgamesh. It is believed that Uruk was the biblical Erech from Genesis 10.10, the second city founded by Nimrod in Shinar. The Epic of Gilgamesh, written by a Middle Eastern scholar 2,500 years before the birth of Christ, commemorates the life of the ruler of the city of Uruk, from which Iraq gets its name. In 2003, just prior to the Iraq invasion which toppled Hussein, astonishing discoveries were being made in Iraq, culminating in one of the most extraordinary claims anywhere for centuries, a claim which American forces have been strongly accused of confiscating, subsequently becoming the prime suspect as the driving force behind a complete suppression of these astonishing discoveries within the country. In April of 2003, Jörg Fassbinder of the Bavarian Department of Historical Monuments in Munich told the BBC's World Services Science in Action program, quote, I don't want to say definitively that it was the grave of King Gilgamesh, but it looks very similar to that described in the epic. We found just outside the city, an area in the middle of the former Euphrates River, the remains of such a building which could be interpreted as a burial, Mr. Fassbinder said. In the book, Gilgamesh is described as having been buried under the Euphrates. He said the amazing discovery of the ancient city under the Iraqi desert had been made possible by modern technology. The most surprising thing was that we found structures already described by Gilgamesh, Mr. Fassbinder stated. We covered more than 100 hectares. We found garden structures and field structures as described in the epic, and we found Babylonian houses. Here, predictably, is where the story goes silent. Due to conflict within the country, it was largely believed the excavations had been halted. However, 
It seems that the discovery of King Gilgamesh may not have been made in isolation. This footage was supposedly leaked to numerous places across the internet, and has largely been put down as authentic footage of the find. Shortly after this was taken, reports state that American forces moved in and seized the find. Why do the powers that be see fit to suppress such discoveries? The very real tombs of characters long thought to have been mythical. Osiris being but one example among many, which have undoubtedly been hidden from the public. Maybe some clues to why his tomb has been hidden lay within the epic and the immense powers Gilgamesh was said to have possessed. He was the fifth king of Uruk, and his power was so mighty, many believe that the stories surrounding him are just myths that were built around his seemingly superhuman strength and endurance. However, serious scholars concluded that the story of Gilgamesh was nothing more than a fairy tale due to the astonishing story. In the epic, the great king is thought to be too proud and arrogant by the gods, and so they decide to teach him a lesson, sending the wild man, Enkidu, to humble him. Enkidu and Gilgamesh, after a fierce battle in which neither are bested, become friends and embark on adventures together. When Enkidu is struck with death, Gilgamesh falls into a deep grief and, recognizing his own mortality through the death of his friend, questions the meaning of life and the value of human accomplishment in the face of ultimate extinction. Casting away all his old vanity and pride, Gilgamesh sets out on a quest to find the meaning of life and, finally, some way of defeating death. In doing so, he becomes the first epic hero in world literature. The grief of Gilgamesh and the questions his friend's death evoke resonate with every human being who has wrestled with the meaning of life in the face of death. Is this leaked footage of the tomb of Gilgamesh? Regardless of its authenticity, why all the secrecy? Are we as a species not capable of being presented with things which test our core beliefs without erupting into chaos? It seems for now, we may have to wait to find out. In one of the world's most war-torn areas, there lies what could quite possibly be one of the most important clues in regards to the construction of ancient structures. Just northwest of Aleppo in Syria rests the very ancient ruins of what is known as Ain Dara Temple. Once completely buried in the sand, subsequently overlooked by the modern world, it is now known to be a literal representation of the Temple of Solomon, built at the same time on an artificial base placed on the highest land in the area. The temple also shared a similar floor plan, entry porch supported by two columns, a main sanctuary divided between an antechamber and a main chamber, and an elevated shrine behind a partition. In 1955, the site gained the attention of numerous scholars from across the world when a large basalt lion was accidentally unearthed, subsequently leading to a full excavation in 1980. By 1985, the entire complex was recognized as extremely significant in ancient times as a place of worship. Much of the structure still possesses evidence of its past grandeur. Various reliefs survive that dot the structure, which depict numerous animals. The interior would have been encrusted in hundreds of finely carved reliefs depicting lions, cherubs, mythical creatures, mountain gods, and ornate geometric designs. But what is surely the most interesting of remaining features is that of a pair of giant footprints, placed in alignment with an altar in the center of the temple, as if they were left as an instruction used by beings who would have been around 60 feet tall. Interestingly, no one really knows who built the temple, and it has been a heated debate for many years. Why would a builder of average size decide to create a positional engraving for worship in the scale of a giant? Are these footprints an obvious clue to the size of the original builders of such structures? It would certainly make ancient buildings such as the pyramids a lot easier to explain. A being of 60 feet in height would be immensely strong and clearly capable of carving the stones. We are now completely perplexed by such as the 12-sided stone in Cusco, Peru among countless other examples of seemingly impossible architecture. Maybe in the future, the footprints will become an extremely important artifact in historical understanding. The awe-inspiring ancient city of Hegra, also known as Madain Saleh, close sister of the equally astonishing 
and cinematically famous ancient site of Petra, is now finally open to the public, able to go and investigate for themselves. We have covered this site, and indeed the gigantic scale of the rock-cut temples, the claimed tombs, and tall doorways to enter these sites. Furthermore, we have covered uncanny similarities found upon rare, unfinished areas of these once astonishingly precisely cut solid rock ruins. In addition to the enormous scale of the stone-cut buildings and the absence of doorsteps, which would have enabled the now average-sized human claimed as having created them, no chance of entering them with ease. This giving credence to the many theories pertaining to these gigantic structures, along with their gigantic scales and their enormous megalithic counterparts found at other sites, linked to by cutting marks previously mentioned, were instead constructed by an ancient, now lost race, far larger than any of today, one capable of these incredible ancient feats. Could these structures have instead of, as so many, as indeed we have postulated, not actually built by ancient man, but were actually made by ancient giants? Not only with the muscular ability to have once lifted such enormous stones into position, such as that of the enormous megalithic stones incorporated into the Great Pyramids of Giza, found within the temples of Baalbek, Gornyashoria, but also almost globally? Could this explain how they were once able to liberate these giant stones from the quarries and bedrocks selected almost many miles from where they were eventually placed with seeming ease? How they were somehow transported, enormous stones high atop mountains, assembling them into the remarkably precise laid polygonal masonry that now drenches the tops of Peruvian peaks? How they once raised the ancient obelisk of Aswan? But I digress. Many have now conceded that the methodology of the Great Pyramids of Giza construction continues to be an enigma in regards to a modern explanation as to how the modern man accomplished such feats. Could this mystery be linked to the cover-up in which many have claimed, and we ourselves encountered, in regard to the remains of this possibly lost civilization, smothered by the Smithsonian? one that we would now perceive as ancient giants? It is a hypothesis which would indeed be a fitting explanation for these mysteries and a cover-up, the stifling of a reason for their continued inexplicability to modern explanation. It is a theory which we find incredibly intriguing. We have in the past covered a vast array of evidence which suggests the past existence of giants Yet, alas, much of what is or has now either unfortunately been suppressed, destroyed, stolen, or forgotten about, with the remains of their initial discoveries now often only to be found remaining, proverbially, cast in stone in the form of the library archives of the world and the news reports now digitally preserved within. Often follow-up reports abruptly ceased after the mention of the rapid arrival and insatiable interest of the Smithsonian, among others in said finds. However, now, thanks to the popularity of such subjects, the power and speed of modern technology, such finds made during excavations involving a large array of individuals make modern cover-ups difficult and are rarely accomplished. With the only modern, almost openly admitted one of note, having followed the discovery of the supposed tomb of Osiris, when all media was immediately banned from the site. When permitted back, the tomb had already been penetrated and was subsequently claimed as having been found empty, supposedly previously looted. This, regardless of its near impenetrability, with Gantenbrink only making it successful with modern robotics. But I digress. Working in cooperation, a team involving the Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, a team from the Penn Museum, University of Pennsylvania, among others, discovered a sarcophagus academically claimed as having belonged to a, quote, King Sobekteheb, probably Sobekteheb the first dated 1780 BC during the 13th dynasty. What we find astonishing regarding the find, however, is its sheer size. 
carved from a single quarried piece of Aswan granite, initially weighing hundreds of tons. This finished tomb still weighs a minimum of 60 tons. It was somehow transported to the burial site and placed seemingly with delicacy where it now lay. Its resting place, inner chamber, also some 3 meters in length. The baffling enigmas of why such size? How were they moved? To explain how these feats were accomplished is far less difficult challenge if one incorporates into their postulations the possibility that the size of these tombs were, in fact, made to measure, indeed a match, to the height and scale of the civilization who buried them. Could the inclusion of ancient giants into the many other theories surrounding the mysteries of Giza solve the puzzle we still can't solve of how these stones were moved? It is a hypothesis which we find very fitting. Alaska, America's largest and most sparsely populated state, although that may not have always been the case. We have previously covered many compelling accounts, reports, excavations, even photographs of this mysterious race. It seems no matter where you turn within controversial archaeological fields, you will inevitably come across reports of giants. They even made it to the notoriously remote Polynesian island better known as Easter. Tales of giants with two rows of teeth, giants with red hair, blonde hair, moon eyes, and even giants from Alaska. Just who were these world-traversing ancient Goliaths? Were all these different tribes related? Were they responsible for the building of many of the ancient structures found around the world, where the placement of huge megalithic blocks still perplexes us to this day? Atlan is known as the Gold District of Alaska, and James L. Perkinson owned a piece of it. An extremely wealthy American miner who found something remarkable in his land, something so impressive, he graciously went to the San Francisco Call newspaper personally to report his findings. Two weeks prior, the first excavations were being made for a tunnel which unfortunately broke through into a layer of an ancient burial ground. Within were seven gigantic skeletons. One was a mere seven feet in height, yet the others were of a tremendously greater stature, some over 10 feet tall. The layer is at a high altitude, and the ground is half frozen, making for great preservation chances," said Perkinson. He believed that many more giants were buried there, as the ones he unearthed were lying comparatively close together. The skeletons were unusually well-formed, but one unique feature was the size of the bones. The forearms were enormous in comparison to usual people. Besides two of the skeletons were spears, rudely shaped and pointed with sharp stones. Other pieces of stone and carved metal were found nearby. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be long before it all seemingly vanished. Regardless, this was a noble act by James L. Perkinson. It is sadly unknown just what did happen to the giants on James' land. This was a report made by James L. Perkinson to, and subsequently reported by, the San Francisco Call on November 18, 1900. In 1977, archaeologists in Poland discovered the astonishing remains of what is now being confirmed was a medieval female giant. It is surprising that the remains survived long enough to be confirmed as an anomaly without mysteriously going missing. But measuring only 7 foot 2 inches, it may have been presumed that she was just abnormally large. Examinations of her remains, still in situ, have concluded that she was thrown into her burial site without much care, as if hunted, killed and buried. She has been named Ostrautomsky, and her remains are located on a lake island, half-hour drive from Poznan. The island includes an ancient palace, church and fortifications. The island has been inhabited since the late Stone Age and the ruins are shrouded in legend. One intriguing ancient story tells of an unknown king who rests together with his knights at the bottom of the lake. While all other burials in the island's cemetery are made with the head facing west, this giant woman was buried facing in the opposite direction. Maybe they believed her kind to be cursed. Many ancient tribes and cultures still retain stories about a long forgotten existence of a race of humans that were much taller and stronger than ordinary men. These giants are described as both brave and barbaric, and legends often mention their cruelty. Plenty of these tales can be found in South America. 
The poet, a tribe from the Nevada region thousands of years ago, had a legend about a race of red-haired giants called the Sea Tika. The ancestors of the poet described them as savage and inhospitable cannibals. In the Northern Payet language, CTK literally means two leaders. The legend states that the giants came from a distant land, crossing the ocean on rafts built out of the tule plant. This legend repeats itself all over the Americas. In the 16th century, Pedro Cesar de Leon recorded an ancient Peruvian tale regarding the origin of the South American giants. According to locals, they also came by sea in rafts of reeds. Some of the men were so tall that from the knee down they were as big as an ordinary man. They tell of the giants waging war on the Payet and all neighboring tribes, spreading terror and devastation. Finally the tribes united against their common enemy and decimated them. The last remaining red-haired giants sought shelter inside a large cave. The tribes eventually started a fire at the entrance, suffocating the giants. In 1886, a mining engineer named John T. Reed happened to hear the legend from a group of Payets while prospecting near Lovelock, Nevada. The Indians told him that the legend was real and that the cave was located nearby. When he found the cave himself, he was unable to begin digging. News soon spread regarding the discovery of Lovelock Cave. But the attention was profit-driven, a guano deposit was discovered inside, and soon after, in 1911, a company started excavating the precious resource shipping more than 250 tons to a fertilizer company in San Francisco. Any artifacts that may have been discovered were probably neglected and lost. However, many may have been stolen away under the guise of fertilizer prospecting, indeed the company may have all along been a Smithsonian ruse, to steal the artifacts from within the cave. After the surface layer of guano had been mined, and the best amongst the smaller relics stolen, strange objects were officially recorded. An official excavation was performed in 1912 by the University of California and 1924. Reports told of thousands of artifacts being recovered, some of them being truly unusual. After a full excavation, removing the entire guano deposit, mummified remains of several red-haired, ancient giants, were found buried in the cave. Measuring between 8 to 10 feet in height, these mummies have since been referred to as the Lovelock Giants. Another intriguing find was a pair of 15-inch long sandals that showed signs of having been worn. Allegedly, other unusually large items were recovered but have since been locked away in museum warehouses and private collections including the giants, only a few remnants of the amazing discovery remains in public display. A piece of evidence that remains on site until this day is a giant hand print, embedded on a boulder inside Lovelock Cave. Made by a giant hand that was covered in soot. Around the same time as the second Lovelock Cave excavation, another dig revealed amazing finds. According to a 1931 article published in the Nevada Review Minor, two giant skeletons had been found buried in a dry lake bed close to Lovelock, Nevada. The oversized remains measured 8.5 and 10 feet in height, and also, what I feel is the most interesting fact of all, were mummified in a manner similar to the one employed by ancient Egyptians. The common trait between these mummified giant remains, and others recorded in the archives of rare preliminary press articles, discovered as far south as Lake Titicaca, is the presence of red hair. While some scientists believe the reddish color is a result of the interaction with the environment in which they were buried, the mummies verify the legends, which describe the sea tiger and their kin as living red-haired giants. With so many remains now missing, it is up to all of us, to collaborate the proof of our mysterious history. Dan Hall, yet pronounced Dane Hall after the Danes. Intriguingly, their purpose, although almost exclusively cut into chalk strata, is completely unknown, and although claimed to have been created by an invading party, were solely created within Kent and South Essex. Consisting of a small vertical entry tunnel, which then opened into what could be described as spacious multi-room living quarters, with the largest inner chambers measuring some 18 feet wide, and some set at a depth of over 80 feet, particularly those found in Hangman's Wood, Essex, which, interestingly, is now known as a site of special biological importance. These unusual chambers have baffled all who have investigated them. Undeniably dating prior to the documentation of history in England, cut into an unusually hard variety of chalk, all of which showing no deer horn, metal or flint tool marks, or any of the stone cutting, 
and many individuals who have investigated the inner chambers have concluded that the Dane holes must have been cut into individual cube blocks and then somehow extracted from the chambers. How this was achieved, however, is yet another mystery. Thankfully, due to Hangman's Wood being a preserved area, more than 50 Dane holes still exist within the three-hectare site. What were the Dane holes used for? Who could have built them? Were they, like a number of other underground chambers we have covered in the past, found the world over, once built to be lived in, clearly attempting to shield oneself from an exterior threat? If so, why? Were ancient peoples in the UK also attempting to hide from something? An initial investigation of the Dane holes was undertaken in the 1800s, with almost nothing regarding the investigation into their origins having been undertaken since. Although, fortunately, they are now receiving independently funded attention, the results of which will be available soon. We will, of course, keep you posted. Who dug the Dane holes? What were they used for? We find said questions highly compelling. <laughs>